first of all, I'm delighted to be here today. It's a privilege to be in such august company. Um, of course, my role, as Guy kindly said, was as, as Director of Construction for the Olympic Delivery Authority for five years. Um, I've now returned to the, to the private sector. I'm delighted to be an executive with Lango Rourke. And as you know, they have a long history of providing infrastructure uh, to Oxford here. And indeed, as we speak, work is going on. That has, of course, been further reinforced by Lango Rourke's commitment to academia and to the training of people and bringing of people into the industry and upskilling uh, through the Lango Rourke Centre for Engineering. Uh, construction here at the department and I, and I think that is a, a great thing. A couple of usual questions just to get them out of the way. Uh, no, I have no tickets whatsoever. Uh, um, <laughs> and yes, the, the, the comedy programme uh, 2012 is much nearer the truth than you might think. <laughs> so laugh at everything, but we actually did lose a busload of people on one occasion. Um, for the thousands of us who had a, an opportunity to work on this programme, it was an experience of a lifetime. Um, indeed, I'm quite sure that many of us would tell our grandchildren all about it, uh, and mighty bored they'll be. Um, however, I do hope this afternoon you'll find it both interesting and, in and informative. Um, the title Engineering, Engineering Success um, has a dual, a dual interpretation which is helpful to me. It allows me to talk to you today about engineering success, complex structures, engineering, across a vast range of disciplines, but also about engineering success. That is, how do you create a successful outcome? How do you precondition at the beginning for success at the end? I won't use the word human engineering because I don't like that, but it is about people as opposed to things. Before I go forward, I'd like to, to set the background and give you some sense of the challenges that were faced and overcome. And of course, because engineering is a continuous process of learning, I'll try and share with you, if I may, some of the lessons that we learned um, as we went along. Uh, it is the biggest uh, event in the world. I'm not going to go through all these the statistics, but there they are. The one to look at is 64 days to go. So there's one or two people getting a bit nervous now. Um, but it will be successful. The games always are. Um, I think that, the, that today the, 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 this operation, uh, the, the delivery of the infrastructure, has won many, many, many plaudits. However, back in 2006, and as Guy hinted at, um, when the ODA was formed, it wasn't quite like that. This is actually Athens. The history of the games in terms of infrastructure construction is littered with failures. Cost overruns, no legacy, massive debts. Vancouver only finished paying about three years ago, 30 years on. Many of the facilities were never used again. No value, and most importantly, no value to communities in the areas. Let us also not forget that within 24 hours of the announcement in Singapore that London would, would host the 2012 Games, the nation was rocked by terrorist atrocities, killing 52 and injuring many hundreds. And within 18 months, would you believe, the world economy would be rocked by the global financial consequences of which we're still suffering. Naturally, politicians saw all these as, as very clear problems in their lordships in the House, clearly identified some obvious concerns, uh, one was that the industry just wouldn't be capable of delivering what it was required to deliver. Uh, and there was reason for them to have those views. Secondly, there would be massive budget overruns, so things were not looking good. The trade press, well, of course, they just saw it in a very defensive way and said, well, we're just going to get kicked again for getting it wrong again. Um, and they would probably be right about that. Um, Jack Rogg, who is the president of the IOC, who's seen many, many, many games organised and, and run, um, puts the whole thing into context for me. And he said to me a long time ago, he said, you know, in order to, to effectively deliver infrastructure for the games and then to run the games itself, it requires the mobilization of a city and a nation and its resources as if going to war. And having had five years at the sharp end, I can assure you that is absolutely the case. So it would be no surprise to you that in those early days, when we first went out at late 06, to, to get a tender to build a stadium, a key component of the games, we only got one bidder, only one company was really interested, and I think they only did it because they felt patriotic, frankly, um, which was decent of them. Um, but nonetheless, I, I then started to investigate with the chief executives and managing directors of, of, of many of the construction companies as to what the problem was. Of course, they pointed out at that time they were all rather busy. There was that heyday of massive amounts of work. But they also then pointed out some, some really serious home truths. We were a one-off customer with a very fixed and public end date. 
Our budget was slightly unclear at the time. We were under constant scrutiny from, all so from many sources. As a team of individuals, we were completely untried. And of course, we were working in the public sector, which doesn't always glow with performance on major projects and programmes. We were also in a goldfish bowl of publicity and media interest, which made life very difficult. And finally, to really just seal the whole thing, they pointed out we were working under the shadow of Wembley. You probably remember that little debacle. Um, so we faced a very difficult situation. Nobody wanted to work for us. What were we going to do about it? Well, we had th th the answer was we wanted to become a client of choice and an, exempl an exemplar um, so that people would want to work for us. And I'll, and I'll return to this theme as we go forward. But now for a moment, a little about the background to the, to the games. Key infrastructure to the, to the games is, is, first of all, the main stadium. That's because that's the opening and closing ceremony, the big events. Secondly, the Athletes' Village, to house nearly 18,000 athletes and their support people. It has to be near the, the centre of activity. And then finally, the press and media centres, which house some 20,000 journalists who broadcast to the world, some 4 billion people. By clustering these three venues together, together with another, a number of others, and setting them in East London, that set really the focus and the, the centre of gravity for the entire Games. However, in East London is a real paradox. Um, <clears throat> It's very close to the wealth of Canary Wharf and the city, as you would know. But it has also suffered generations of neglect, decay, decline, underinvestment, neglect, physical, and in even more importantly, social. In reality, if you get on the Jubilee Line at Westminster Station and travel to Stratford Station, life expectancy drops by nine years. That's one year for every station you pass. The choice of East London, in mind those challenges, was also um, was very important in terms of the actual award of the Games. I'm personally convinced that it was the choice of a place which would need social regeneration and economic regeneration was a key swinger in bringing the Games to London. Uh, because, of course, the focus was on lasting legacy, and I'll use that word a lot throughout this discussion. However, as a location to host the Games, uh, you couldn't have found a more difficult place. This is actually the site of the main stadium. 240 hectares in total, centuries of industrial misuse, uh, industrially contaminated with everything from heavy metals to petrochemicals, and tens of thousands of tonnes of demolished materials from the Blitz, including 1,000-pound ordnance. We found quite a few of those, but none went off. Um, Surrounded by densely populated areas, crisscrossed by rivers and canals, major railways running through it and around it, highly congested and limited road access, and I'll show you a little of that later, um, the scale of the task both in engineering terms and from a logistics point of view was both clear and immense. From the start, our focus was always not just on infrastructure, but on the people. And it started during the construction phase when the ODA set targets, aggressive targets for employment, for skills, for safety, for welfare, for training, equality, diversity, and sustainability. And the importance of that I cannot uh, uh, overestimate. In fact, London 2012 is actually a regeneration program, and I think hopefully you'll get that sense as we move through. To organise the Games, in theory, is very straightforward. It is a commercial contractual arrangement between the organising committee, that is LOCOG, the London Organising Committee of the Games, on behalf of the Mayor and the City, with the IOC. And it's interesting to note that in Singapore, within eight minutes of Jack Rogg saying London, Ken Livingston was taken around the back to sign the contract. It's that tight. It's a serious business. Uh, LOCOG, of course, organise and run the Games, and they are funded from the private sector through ticket sales, through media rights and sponsorship, to the tune of about £2 billion. They're financially underwritten by the Treasury, and security is underwritten by the Home Office. Government is also responsible for a whole series of venues, mainly the permanent venues. LOCOG tend to deal with temporary venues. For government to discharge their obligations in terms of, of, of these venues, they formed the Olympic Delivery Authority in, in 2006 under an Act of Parliament as a non-departmental public body, specifically, amongst other things, with powers to undertake our own planning. You may think that made it easier. It actually made it harder. Uh, but there we are. We reported directly to the Secretary of State of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. And our mission was very straightforward, to deliver venues, facilities and infrastructure, together with transport, 
in a way which maximised sustainable legacy within the available budget. Uh, and the available budget is one just to think about. So these two agencies um, then reported to the Olympic Board, which comprised ministers, the mayor, chief executive and uh, uh, chairman of LOCOG, the British Olympic Association and the ODA. In simple terms, the ODA builds the theatre and LOCOG puts on the show. In the early days, we, we decided that we as an organisation wanted to be a small, lean, agile public authority. You probably think those two all don't go together, but that's what we wanted to do. Our intention was to set policy and direction to define requirements and appoint contractors. We also wanted to be very, very intrusive. We were not going to sit back from taking on our client responsibilities. We wanted to be in amongst it from the start. For this reason, we originally sought a program management organisation, but because we wanted to be too, so intrusive, we decided that would inhibit our ability to deal with the supply chain in the way we wanted. So in fact, we moved to a different option, which was to appoint a delivery partner. Uh, that was an organisation after a tendering process one was, was, was chosen, which contained a program management group, a project management group, and people with expertise in construction and engineering. And I'm delighted to say that Langer Rock was indeed one of those organizations. This allowed us to really be able to both control the operation and also to get into the supply chain. The result was an organization with 250 ODA staff, some 550 from the delivery partner, totally integrated to the extent that uh, once we got really organised, you couldn't tell who worked for who. It was a fully top-to-bottom, zipped-up operation, and it served, in my view, the whole enterprise very well. Of course, with so much money at stake, public money, um, governance was a big issue. And, and indeed, I think we, we reported to some 14 different areas within government, uh, and that's setting aside the National Audit Office and the place that no one wants to go, the Public Accounts Committee, once a year in Parliament. Um, we had to deal with lottery, with lottery funding, with funding from Sport England, and the money from government didn't come from central government. It was actually allocated out of different departments. So, of course, each permanent secretary had a big interest in what was happening to his cash. So it did become very important that we communicated well. We also set major priority themes, as I've said, particularly dealing with people. We published these widely, and they were an important part of our whole drive for legacy. One of the things that was important was that we validated everything we did. We got audited out of our minds, and frankly, I didn't mind it very much because it was fine. We were inter internally audited and externally audited, but what it did do, because we said what we were going to do and we did it, and we could prove it through the audit processes, people started to, to gain trust that when we said we would do it, we would. The Olympics, from a programme point of view, is a real marathon. The, 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 the UK made submissions for the 92 Games, the 96 Games and the 2000 Games, all of which were unsuccessful. The 2012 bid actually started in 2002, ten years out. So, but that, however, is another story. I'll pick it up now at 2006 when the ODA was formed. The government set a strategy for us that said they wanted us to com substantially complete at about 85% by value, and they wanted that to occur one year before the Games. So the date for us was actually the 27th of July of last year. This was a, an interesting strategic decision, the intention being to avoid the pitfalls of previous Games and maximise on the capability to test and familiarise the use of the venues. Personally, and in retrospect, I think it was more about saying if we tell them to get it done a year early, they might just get it done on time. <laughs> but there we go. And you might have heard the mayor recently, when we did actually complete as was required, threatened to hold what he called a snap Olympics last year. <laughs> as always with a major programme of such a scale and complexity, we, we, met, we, we, we choked it up into manageable elements, and then we said every, every year exactly what we were going to do in great and granular detail. And then we reported on our performance, and generally we found we were achieving it. And yet again, this started to build increasing confidence, particularly with politicians. It became what we call dead boring delivery. And I can assure you, politicians absolutely love that. So all of that came to a conclusion substantially in the middle of last year, when we, we handed over the first elements of the park, and we completed full handover in January of this year. And you're probably aware from, from the press, uh, that a number of events have already been staged, world records are, are already being broken in some of the venues, and uh, 
it has allowed sufficient time for the second stage of the arrangement, which is for LOCOG to put in all of their temporary facilities. I mentioned budget before. Budget was an iterative process. It started back in 2002, a highly optimistic budget, and I'm very glad it was highly optimistic, because had it not been, no one would have probably gone forward, and we wouldn't be having the games now. The budget originally was half a billion pounds, but it was based on the fact that it would be all entirely using existing facilities, which was a really a hope over reality, but at least it got the thing started. During 03-04, it moved to about three and a half billion pounds, and when the ODA was formed, we did a complete top-to-bottom assessment and explained to government we thought they're going to need about nine billion pounds, which rather caused some, some hiatus of excitement. Um, however, the other thing that drove those costs up was the fact that increasingly the whole issue of regeneration became a key issue. And if you want to regenerate, you have to spend money. And you have to look at it as an investment, not just as a cost. And I'll come back to that. So by 2007, we had a total budget of 9 billion, of which 2 billion was actually allocated for policing and security, for Legion community sports, for operational requirements and contingency, which left the ODA with 7.2 billion. Uh, I won't go through the breakdown, there it is. Very important to recognise, for every pound of that 7.2 billion, 75 pence is actually attributable to regeneration and legacy. Now I'd like to highlight for you just a few examples of the engineering achievements and the challenges faced. Vast range of disciplines on a professional basis. I've never been anywhere and seen so many different, different activities and operations going on in one place. One of the first, uh, first challenges was, was, was that. There are 52 power lines that, that cost right over the centre of the Olympic Park. They had to be removed and relocated, and without, without moving them, we couldn't really start anything because the catenaries were not that far off the ground. Um, it was a highly complicated piece of work, very critical, um, and in my view, the most high-risk project we had, and we'll see why in a moment. <coughs> They're also critical because they carry about a third of London's power, particularly Canary Wharf and the city, so damage them at your peril. <coughs> But what the answer was to construct 12 kilometres of, of tunnels below ground, some 3 metres in diameter, 30 metres below, and install in, in them 200 kilometres of heavy-duty copper cabling and conductors, together with all the, the equipment to cool them and ventilate these, because, of course, it's essential to keep them cool, together with switchgear, transformers, and the planoply of electrical equipment needed. This ambitious project was completed, £250 million on time and to budget, interestingly, when we talked to National Grid and EDF Power Networks and they told us how long they normally took to do these jobs, we simply said it wasn't acceptable. And we formed effectively a virtual joint venture with them, with consultants and a major contractor and decided we were going to try and do the job in half the normal time. And that's exactly what happened. I think EDF and National Grid are still trying to figure out how they did it. <laughs> uh, and I don't joke, I'm serious. Um, of course, it wasn't always plain sailing, as with many of the ent enterprises we were engaged on. And in this particular case, it was very, very trying when one of the four tunnel boring machines working below ground, we became aware that ahead of this was a large obstruction which had not shown up on any of the site investigations. We had a very, very stark choice. The choice was to reverse the machine out about a mile and a half and then come in from the other end and then effectively mine in between to remove the obstruction. The cost was going to be in tens of millions and the time involved in many months, both of which were unacceptable. There was, however, a technical option which was to simply move offline and go around it. And, and that we had the capability to do. I think we had about five days to make the decision, after which we either kept going straight on plan A or we went round on plan B. Um, we decided we'd divert, which seemed to be the only solution, so we, we, so we started to, to proceed. Of course, we then run into the problem that compulsory purchase processes above us on the ground under which we were tunnelling had not all been completed. So we discovered that we were going to be tunnelling illegally for some time. Uh, for a public authority to go illegal was somewhat challenging, but that's exactly what we did in the interest of the public purse. Um, the job was finished, as I said, on time. It took us nearly a year to sort out the legal wrangle, but we did get it sorted eventually. Um, seizing control. The site... Um, where it is in East London is, is not a place you would walk around at night, if I can put it like that. Um, following the, the compulsory purchase order completions on July the 27th, 2007, exactly five years from the Games, 
we were given full control of the site and we did actually seize control. We, we first of all put in 12 kilometres of very temporary hoarding which over time we expanded to 17 kilometres of highly sophisticated security fences which are intruder proofed, covered by nearly 3,000 cameras and a lot of sophisticated kit. But uh, in those early days it really was about seizing control of the ground. Just as an aside, this bridge at Pudding Mill Lane, I just love the names, um, is, an, is a, actually a, a vehicular underpass. This is the only access into the Olympic Park from the south. There's no other way in, so this is it. It gives you some idea of the logistics challenge. Of course, when we moved on to the park, it was interesting. I remember visiting, this is just the second day of our getting onto site, and it was like a ghost town. I, it was quite unnerving. Uh, doors swinging in the breeze, cups on tables, papers, papers flapping on desks. There was everything except people. Very strange. We weren't universally welcomed, of course, um, and we had security guards shot at and regularly beaten up, which was fairly difficult. One of the reasons why ultimately we finished up with a very substantial police force on site. Of course, we then got ourselves on the map and we commenced our demolition of some 270 buildings and factories, old and new, industrial direction to be removed, as well as bus depots and rail depots. Late in 07, a very old and highly flammable building decided to catch fire. You could, as you can see from this photograph, uh, you could see the smoke from central London, particularly from Westminster and Downing Street. <laughs> and the phones, I have to say, became red hot that day. And uh, it was a very, very salutary lesson that everything we did was in the public domain, and from Prime Minister down, people just didn't want any surprises. Moving now to, to <coughs> excavation and remediation. Once we got demolition underway, the next step was land remediation. Now, the simple truth was we could have dug it all up, disposed of it, and replaced it with suitable material. That solution was neither environmentally or economically sustainable, and we had to find another, another, another way, and that was reuse. And the task of that was daunting, to use material from some 270 demolished buildings to dig up another 1.4 million cubic metres of material from contaminated ground. Divided, the site was divided into, seven, into 15 zones. Each zone was then checked for contaminants. We sunk over 4,000 boreholes. We took over 30,000 samples. For two years, we had 40 chemists on site with £2 million worth of highly sophisticated equipment. And what we undertook was actually a huge game of checkers. We would dig up material, it would then be tested, it would be put into quarantine while the tests were, re were reviewed. The tests would then indicate the necessary type of remediation and it would then be moved into, into remediation processes ranging from soil washing, bioremediation, soil stabilization, grading and crossing. Just to do this required us to immobilize probably one of the largest earth moving fleets ever seen in UK. Material moved up to four or five times as it went through this complex process until it was finally put into its final resting place. The result, however, was that 98% of all material demolished or excavated was actually reused. Very little ever had to be taken off the site. This is the main stadium, our first, the first venue we awarded with some challenges I noted earlier, um, but with a very, very challenging brief. The brief was that it should be a 25,000 seat stadium for athletics and multi-sport in legacy. And that was the objective. However, in the meantime, it had to accommodate 80,000 seats for games time. And initially, this proved an extremely difficult uh, challenge to find a sustainable solution within the budget of 496 million pounds. And for many months, an integrated design and construction team, which is something we had on all of our projects, um, really, really struggled. However, as is often the case, there was that eureka moment when a design emerged. And it's a very sophisticated design, but like all good engineering, it looks very simple. They came up with a highly innovative solution, which first of all used the, the rolling topography of the site uh, as it sloped down from the, from the north to the south to create, in effect, a massive amphitheatre which accommodated the 25,000 seats. It also created all of the, a lot of the services, the, the, the necessary infrastructure, all of it in this effectively almost below ground um, structure. We then created a podium which you can see around the stadium, which was really for crowd circulation during games time and also for all the temporary facilities like toilets for instance, 
um, which would all be sit, sited on, on that uh, podium. From that podium sp sprang two structures. You can see to the upper part of the picture a black steel structure on which are placed precast concrete units. That is actually a temporary structure which provides 55,000 seats. Around it, and totally independent of it, is the tubular steel structure in white, which, which actually supports the massive lighting gantries that are necessary for high resolution TV work at night, also for the high wire acts which will be used during the opening and closing ceremonies, and the roof which covers about 40% of the seating. These structures are totally demountable and they're designed to be taken down to, and to be relocated. And this wasn't an idle myth. When Chicago was potentially in contention for, for the next get one of the next the upcoming games, we had discussions with them about selling it to Chicago. So and I think if it ever gets moved, which I hope it won't, it'll still go somewhere useful. Interestingly, it, the weight of this structure is about 75% less than a conventional stadium because actually all you're doing is supporting seats, not a lot of other stuff. And, and this was further reinforced by that white tubular pipework, which was actually, would you believe, redundant gas pipeline found in a yard up in the northeast of England. Um, so a very low carbon footprint there. Most visitors who, who go to the, the stadium are amazed by its simplicity and particularly by its human scale. Um, it's very different to the, bird, the bird's cage in, um, in Beijing. It's a very inclusive design, very accessible. It's engineering at its very best. Engineering challenges, of course, abound, and here's another one. Um, we were, in the early days, accused of being the flat pack or IKEA games because they thought our designs weren't interesting. Well, I don't know which box this was going to come out of, but it wasn't a flat top box, that's for sure. This is an incredible, incredible building. It's, it is, in fact, of course, built for games, two 50-metre pools, a, 50 meter, a, a dive pool, 2,500 seats. This is the legacy building. No one has yet seen this building because it hasn't yet been finished. Uh, we've had a lot of criticism of what we have got, but then, of course, that's only temporary. It's also, of course, built by one of the, or designed by one of the most iconic architects in the world, and um, interestingly enough, we all got on like a house on fire, and I do not mean literally. Um, she's an incredible woman. In order to accommodate the requirement for the games, which is a further 16,000 additional seats, we built two temporary wings, and they're not hugely attractive, they're very, very functional. Um, but they do the job, and even when you're sitting at the very top of them, you can still see the pools, and I, and I can assure you that it is true. It is like an iceberg, however, almost as much of the building is below ground as you can see above it, and below ground are all the pumps, all the complex services necessary to run the facility, as well as all of the necessary equipment to raise and lower the pool floors. And that's because during games you need pools which are about three, and a half, three to three and a half meters deep, but of course in legacy that would be inappropriate. So the pool floors rise in order that you can say, have children swimming. It's, that's what legacy is all about. Unfortunately, and you can't get all your planning right, um, this, is, this facility sits directly over one of the power lines undergrounding tunnels, which was about 100 feet below, and we had to then put in a massive transfer structure to ensure that we didn't deform that by the loading coming down from the building. So that was one we didn't quite get right. This is really the centerpiece of the structure, which sadly you can't see anymore. Um, three and a half thousand tons of structural steel, incredibly complex structure. I went, I'm now going out to South Wales, the fabricators were all built in UK. Uh, and, and a couple of the guys said to me, there's not a straight piece of steel in it, Gov. And there wasn't. <laughs> Very complex. Um, it built and it sits on actually only on three, on three bearings, two fixed at the far end and one sliding at the near end. But because, I suppose you wanted to make life difficult, but because of the, actually the, 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 the erection sequence, we had to start at the wrong end. So we started at the sliding end, which we fixed, and then we completed execution of the roof. And then we lifted the roof a metre, allowed it to settle, uh, and relax, and then place it in its, uh, in its final resting position. <coughs> Fairly tense time for the engineers, but I have to say, it, all the calculations work perfectly. Just as an aside, in my view, that roof would not have been capable of being designed in the way it was ten years ago. The technology BIM did not exist. Just focusing on, on the, the legacy issue and the no white elephants issue, the, the structure to the top right is the water polo uh, facility. Now, there's no legacy use for water polo in this country, so it was built entirely of components. The pools are, are componentized, and they've already got a resting place. They're going somewhere else. The structures are all componentized. They can be used for all sorts of structures, as is, this, as is the seating, thus meeting, as I said, one of our key elements, no white elephants. Athletes Village. 
very different set of challenges. Here we were building a community effectively of nearly 2,800 apartments split almost equally between affordable and private housing. Um, together with an academy for some 1,800 pupils, that's the round structure on the bottom right, um, together with a major health facility, and it is a major health facility. This, of course, is only the start of housing on the Olympic Park. After the Games, there will be another 8,000 units constructed. During the Games, of course, the, the academy will be used for control of the Games, and the health centre, naturally, will be used for sports medicine. To house 17,500 athletes there, of course, the occupancy rates and, and the densities are much higher, so there are no kitchens in these apartments. There are extra bathrooms and additional, com and, and additional um, uh, partitioning to facilitate additional extra bedrooms. There are 66 residential blocks set in 11 plots around podium gardens, and the whole is set in extensive landscaping, um, and that flows into the 150-acre Olympic Park. It is designed to not be harsh and aggressive. It, is, it does not look like Soviet-style architecture, I can assure you. We had 19 different architectural practices working the facades to try and encourage a different look. It's very unusual to construct something on this scale from a housing point of view in one single phase, and particularly in under three years. However, that was not the only challenge. It was originally conceived in those heady days when there was all money about as a developer-led, private sector-funded operation. So in fact, we simply let it as a, uh, an opportunity to a developer. The developer then set about construction using construction management approach, breaking the whole thing into work packages. However, unfortunately, in 2008, with the banking crisis now becoming real, uh, the funding evaporated. Fortunately, by then, we had done a huge amount of procurement. We'd managed to make very substantial savings. We had not really spent any of our contingency. And we were able to step in as, as the government organization to pick up the financial burden. In doing that, we also took a very critical view and review of the project and decided that whilst we understood the reasons for the developer approaching his delivery in the way he did, we didn't think that was quite the thing for us. So we converted over 60% from construction management into tier one lump sum fixed price contracts. The reason for that was that the housing market then was totally flat. There were huge resources in the marketplace and importantly, expertise in medium rise construction. The result was that we got very attractive prices, not stupid, of, of all the contractors who worked, only one ultimately went bankrupt, and it wasn't, I have to say, because of us, it was a result of Irish debt problems. Um, we got excellent performance and, and, and a first-class product. This is probably one of our most elegant venues. This is the, the velodrome. Um, it's very, very sustainable. The timber for the track and external cladding is all from, from uh, sustainable sources. 100% natural ventilation, maximise use of natural light, low carbon cable net roof. That, there is a roof, there is a cable net there, you can hardly see it. So very minimum use of steel. Seats about 5,000 people, um, joint games and legacy. Again, the key was an in integrated design and construction team. However, of course, engineering isn't always just about careful calculation exact designs. Experience, empathy also play a part. And I well remember the track expert who's been building tracks for velodromes for about 40 years. Just before handover, when this photograph was taken, um, I got a call to say that everyone was very worried. The track expert had, had said he wanted more ventilation cut in the walls to cool the track and give it more air. And they said, what do you think we should do? I said, I think you should do exactly what he said. He's the expert. So that's what we did. Of course, it demonstrated the value of experience only about two months ago, Olympic records were broke, world records were broken there. I think mainly because of, of the track. Perhaps from elegance to brutal utility. Um, what do you do with 240 broadcasters and 20,000 journalists? Well, you put them in some very big buildings. Um, the big building in the foreground is the, uh, is the, is the media broadcast centre. That's where the, the world receive. That's the start of the world receiving pictures to four billion people. Um, it's a huge building. They, I'm told you can get five jumbo jets in there. Um, it is simply enormous. And with the heat of all the electronics, and with, of course, the journalists who create their own heat, no doubt, um, 
You'll see the large gantry on the front houses all of the temporary air conditioning uh, and air handling equipment to keep the place cool and also all the standby power to ensure it runs absolutely unbroken 24 hours a day. Behind it is an office complex which will ultimately become an office complex for, for sale or rent which houses the print journalists. Interestingly, print journalists don't mix with TV journalists. They're kept in separate buildings. So. <laughs> Seriously. Um, there are some temporary facilities as well. There's a multi-story car park to the right that you can't quite see. Uh, and importantly, a catering facility which is going to produce some 50,000 meals a day, I'm told. Time precludes me from talking about many venues, but there are many more that we constructed. And they all have their own high spots and uh, are all of in, in, in class, as it were. But I've got to mention total infrastructure. Here you see one of two combined heat and power plants. Together with substations, distribution networks, we ripped out everything <coughs> when we remediated the area. So we had to replace all of the power distribution systems, water, gas, comms, everything was replaced. 12 kilometres of roads, 35 bridges, 150 acres of parkland, the first park in London in 150 years. It just goes on. Uh, 4,000 trees, 120,000 plants, 30,000 wetland plants. Even the flower mix was designed by Sheffield University to flower with particular colours at a particular time of opening of the games. And on the trials last year, it worked perfectly. Transport infrastructure was another element of our works. We invested some £900 million in transport infrastructure. This is Stratford, and I'll come back to why it's so important. These investments included Docklands Light Railway, East London Line, high-speed trains from Stratford International Station into King's Cross and St Pancras, and a major expansion of the Stratford Transport Hub, including the bus area as well as the trains. This was particularly important to us because 85% of our workforce were intended to come to Olympic Park on public transport. There were no private cars allowed on the park. And in fact, 85% of, of visitors during the Olympics will also come on public transport. So this was a key to our logistics operation. Now I'd like to sort of start moving away from just the engineering to some of the other challenges, and then we'll move into people issues. You remember that tunnel at the, 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 the south end of the site, that was the only way in? Well, this is the other, the other entrance at the north end, which comes off the, the A12. Our challenge was to facilitate 15 to 18,000 people every day getting onto the park and leaving without fuss. To arrange for materials from thousands of suppliers, actually one truck coming through this facility every 40 seconds, day in, day out. And we wanted also to make life as easy as we could for our contractors and all working there. Our, our job was to facilitate. Taking logistics in this way also offered us some other opportunities. We, we decided that we would take full responsibility for logistics ourselves. We would carry all the risks involved in running that. So that if things went wrong, we would carry the blame and we would carry the cost. But we felt that was the only thing to do. It also had a big advantage for us because it allowed us to create, to create incident management regimes which have actually now moved and been replicated into preparations for the games themselves and also provided business continuity <coughs> systems which became very sophisticated. One of our most challenging negotiations, I remember with Treasury, who as many of you will know is not a spending department, um, uh, to explain to them that we wanted £365 million pounds, um, in order to run the logistics programme. They were horrified and said we could build some venues for that. And we said, well, yes, we could. Except if we built the venues, you wouldn't be able to use them because it wouldn't be finished in time, because you wouldn't be able to get to the job. After quite a lot of debate, they agreed that it was necessary. But as always, they wanted to just keep a little hold on the money. And we agreed that we would incrementally spend the money against demand. So it would be a supply, a demand-driven supply. So we, we would match our requirements as the people numbers grew and the vehicle movements grew. We would expand our operations. And we used to call it the irreducible minimum. So we only spent as much as we needed at each step of the way. And it worked very well. And actually, we res it resulted in making many tens of millions of pounds saving. A thousand vehicles a day coming into this area would have caused total chaos to the road system. So we built logistics centers capable of, ca of holding some three to 500 vehicles. Um, one on the M11 to the north and one in Barking in, in Dagenham. And both of these were used for all vehicles coming to the park. They all had to go there, they had to be booked in, they were searched and screened. And then we could pulse them in under control into the park. 
that the uh, transit times were timed, so we knew when they left and we knew when they arrived. And if they were out of time, they were researched. If they were in time, they were allowed in. We also built massive on-site facilities, temporary roads, temporary bridges. We provided busing for the thousands of people. Critical, critical fuel supplies w w came under our control. Um, everything to do with making the place work. Also, we had to facilitate the basis of what, what, is, what will become and is becoming the security regime for the, for the games. So we very early on instigated personal screening, hand and, eye recog hand, hand and retina recognition, airport style screening. At the UK Borders Agency and Metropolitan Police have been an intrinsic part of our team for nearly four and a half years. And they're fully embedded. And of course, it's now allowing them to seamlessly move into games preparation. As someone once said, there are no problems, just opportunities. And remember those railway lines and waterways, the cause of such problems? Well, they provided a massive opportunity. We decided to, 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 to set up two railheads, one to the south of the park and one for the Olympic Village. Those railheads, which of course utilised the railway lines in and around us, allowed us to move 2.4 million tonnes of material onto the park without vehicle deliveries. It actually saved 150,000 vehicle movements. Uh, which was a big issue and a massive uplift in our, in our carbon performance. Marine facilities were also utilised. What little waste we did generate, we containerised and moved off the park by barge. For me, the logisticians have always been the unsung heroes. Security is a huge issue for the Olympics. This will be the first Olympic Games held in a Western capital since 9-11 and 7-7. So it is... No surprise that you've seen so many of the preparations going on. And these preparations have been going on now for over three years. So what you're seeing now is simply the final stages of trialling and testing. The task was very broad. First of all, to secure the Olympic Park during construction when risk was considered to be relatively low, but then to prepare the park for games time when the risk is seen to be very high. We used a process called Secure by Design, which is the Association of Chief Police Officers process for standardising mechanisms to design out um, areas for, that allow potential criminality in buildings, and I'll come back to that in a moment. One of the other big challenges, though, was resilience, and sadly we've all heard so often of improvised explosive devices, both personnel and vehicle-borne, and these are a real challenge. And finally, all that we did had to be validated, because on the, unfortunately one had to look at the grim reality that if anything happened, then public inquiries would be held. This whole process starts at cabinet level with what is called the Olympic Security, Safety and Security Strategic Risk, Ass Risk Assessment, or OSRA for short. That leads to an identification and allocation of risk to the bodies most appropriate to deal with it. We use this data and information from Metropolitan Police and Security Services to develop our own park-wide security assessments and then to move to vulnerability surveys which identified where the, the park could be vulnerable and what we should do about it. We applied these processes to every part of the park and to every venue. We categorised the threats into a whole range right, from protest, theft, petty crime, organised crime, fraud and of course terrorism. The results identified areas for action and these charts simply show how this was done. That's actually the aquatic centre. It shows potential criminality vulnerabilities within that building and it shows how they are collected, collated and then solutions identified. And it's simple things like designing out small dark areas in a building where someone could loiter, for instance. It simply removes a risk. All of the entire process I've mentioned was accredited and validated, and that's very important because in dealing with risk, if you can't resolve it, you're left with a residual risk. And it is therefore essential that that residual risk is then identified and dealt with, often not by physical means but by an operational requirement. So it may be that you put a policeman in that corner rather than trying to reconfigure the whole building. After all, it's only for 30 days or so. One issue, though, which became very complex was that of resilience. This is about the ability of buildings to withstand explosive attack. Now, from the point, it is, it is as I've said at the top of the slide, the resolution of conflicting objectives. We're trying to design iconic buildings for an environment which will be relatively risk-free in legacy, but which will withstand the potential for serious attack during games time. Personnel devices are challenging, but can be dealt with through secure by design. 
You can design out physical vulnerabilities in the building by reinforcing them or in fact creating standoff, which denies the attacker the ability to get his explosives near a vulnerable part of the building. And of course the other big issue is to deal with flying debris, which is of course one of the biggest dangers. Vehicle-borne de devices, however, are far more complex. By their very nature, they're larger, their impact's much greater. One approach is to harden all the venues, that is to make them capable of withstanding a blast at close proximity. However, when we assessed the cost of doing this, setting aside the impact on iconic designs, it looked like being way, way north of £100 million. So we had to come up with an alternative strategy, and the strategy was that of standoff. Deny the attackers the ability to bring hostile vehicles close to the targets. And this was done by, by, by both overt and covert means, hostile vehicle mitigation. You can create topography, use rivers to stop people being able to get vehicles across, or you simply build barriers. In many cases, though, it was not possible to create that situation because you just couldn't get sufficient standoff distance. And therefore, we've, we found ourselves dealing with it in a very unique way, which is what we believe a first, and is now being looked at with interest in many countries. We allow the designs to proceed without any consideration of this particular problem. At a point generally around stage D, RIBA stage D, we stopped the design, and the design was taken off the designers and given to specialists and security personnel. They then checked the designs against the vulnerabilities for explosives that would impact on the building, and we then had them design the necessary mitigating measures that would reinforce the building. We then passed those mitigations back to the contractors with the simple instruction, do what you're told and don't ask why. We took full responsibility for what had been designed um, because that's government's obligation. In order to be sure that what had been designed was going to work, we then undertook, on many occasions, full-scale trials. This happens to be an element of, of a, a very large facade. We took them to the ranges up in the north of England and blew them up. Um, simulated the potential for attacks to validate the designs. As I said, this is a very unusual process, uh, a first of its type, and it's produced very effective solutions and reduced the cost, would you believe, by 75% of the original estimate. I'd now like to turn to successful engineering, but actually engineering success. How do you create a successful outcome? I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to try and speed up a little. Projects and programs that are successful tend to, to display very similar characteristics or traits. So if you can understand them and replicate them at the beginning, then the chances are you may have a greater chance of success yourself, what we call preconditioning for success. In my view, one of the greatest lessons from 2012. In my early career, I had always believed that successful delivery relied, relayed entirely on, on the three R's, a ruthless, remorseless and relentless drive for completion. However, very quickly, I and my colleagues came to the conclusion that we needed the three L's, leading, listening, and liaising. And of these, listening was perhaps the most important. And remember those views of industry in the early days. So we listened very carefully, and everyone saw a unique opportunity for industry to showcase what UK PLC could do on a world stage. Showcase the best of Britain in design, engineering, manufacturing, and construction. And therefore was born the 2012 Construction Commitments, which were all about setting six very clear, I use the word strategies, commitments, <coughs> commitments, I don't like the word charters, commitments as to how we as the ODA would behave and how we expected other people to behave. And I'd, and I'd like to very quickly take you through these six, because they are very, very important to, to the ultimate successful outcome. I'm going to leave safety to last, because it is the one that pulls everything together and is, for many of us, the most important. First of all, client leadership. We made it very clear from the start that we would lead. We would not stand by. We would get on with our job. The fact is, industries don't create marketplaces. Clients do, and clients generally get exactly what they deserve. We decided to work hard at being exemplary. So we shouldered our responsibilities. We sought to create and foster an environment for success where everybody, corporate or individual, could give of their best and raise the bar in their personal and corporate performance. Over time, this developed into a very interesting situation of corporate commitment expressed at one chief executive's forum, which I held every four months, where, as a, as a, as a group, they, uh, one of the spokesmen said, look, 
we're going to deliver all this on a, on a world-class stage. UK PLC will perform, and no one around this table is going to let anyone down. Now, for an industry that's normally pretty fragmented and un unclear about itself, that was very, very powerful stuff. Commitment to people was vital, and, and I believe that this, is, this was another most important key. We wanted to everyone working on the programme or living around it or impacted by it to feel that they were demonstrably cared about and would be looked after, would be supported and allowed to give of their best. I remember a very early public meeting, and some of these early public meetings were quite unpleasant if you've not been exposed to it. One and a half thousand angry people can make a lot of noise and it's quite difficult to handle. I remember one very difficult meeting and someone finally summed up the meeting by saying, look, you've told us what you're going to do, we hear what you say, we don't believe you, however, we will let you have a go as long as you respect us and you leave us something in legacy. And I think that was so important. And it was a cornerstone, respect became a cornerstone of the working relationship with the 40,000 people who have since worked on the Olympic Park. Formal agreements with trade unions and the TUC simply underpinned national agreements. We linked employment and training, equality and diversity for outreach programs into local communities. We, we remember the huge earth moving operations we had, had to undertake, we were short of drivers. We set up a driving school with, with, uh, within government, with local and, and central government funds. JCB, Anthony Bamford, gave us a million pounds worth of his equipment for nothing. And when I asked him why, he said, you know, our equipment is good, but good drivers make it look better. So we like training drivers. Um, we also had the, what we call the ethos of direct employment. The construction industry has become very fragmented and also casualized. And this has meant that things like training and safety have been eroded. We wanted the vast majority of our labor force on the park to be directly employed. And where that wasn't possible, we wanted the same safeguards of holidays, insurance, sick pay and the like to be available to those who were self-employed. And again, I think it was a very important step. Training was important with thousands of training initiatives. 11% of the workforce had been previously employed, 16% in the local BAMI community. I could go on. What does all this mean in hard cash terms? It's not motherhood and apple pie, and this is a hard-nosed business operation. Well, when we started, we thought we'd need 15 to 18,000 people to construct the park. In fact, we never exceeded 12,500. What does that mean in cash terms? Because we had less people, we needed less buses, less facilities. We saved 80 million pounds on those issues alone. So having an engaged workforce, properly looked after, in my view, is very, very good business. Design quality was important. The, 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 the facilities had to be functional for, for, for long-term civic use, but of course meet games requirements, and we've seen some of that already. One of the key issues was client briefs. We would not go out into the marketplace unless we were absolutely sure we knew exactly what we wanted and it was signed off. And all of the things we did in terms of design quality were all assessed by independent assessors, including Cabe and others, to bring people along with us, rather than having people on the sidelines throwing bricks at us and chattering. Technology was essential. I mentioned a little earlier that without the, the technology, some of the designs would not have been possible. Sustainability was vital. The whole point was to leave a lasting environment for social and economic benefit. I believe that the ODA fulfilled this, this regeneration process, particularly underpinned by the fact that there are no white elephants. This, of course, is only the start. This is a kickstart of major long-term regeneration, and I think it's great to see the London Legacy Development Corporation now in place, fully funded, and taking up the mantle. Remember all that land that was remediated? Very little of it has actually yet been used. So there is a huge amount of potential, as the economy improves, for the land to be sold. Actually, I think ultimately it will prove to be a very profitable program in terms of return to, the, to society and the exchequer. The only thing we, we really didn't do very well on sustainability was a 50% carbon emission reduction, and we failed. We just couldn't get a way to put up a wind turbine. But that's another story. Procurement and integration was very important. We wanted to buy value, not lowest cost. We used balanced scorecards to assess the capability of our contractors to actually take account of the many priorities we had, as well as just time and cost. We let over 1,500 direct contracts, of which about 100 were for major Tier 1 contractors, and they then subcontracted sub to a further 3,000. And then there were thousands more contracts throughout the UK 
one of the particularly important issues was that 98% of the contractors employed and their supply chains are British owned or British registered companies. We had three rules which were very simple. If you wanted one to take a procurement process and go to the market, the first thing was a, a design to stage D signed off by all stakeholders. The second was a business case signed off by government. And the third was that you had tested the offering to, to industry to assess its level of interest and where they could advise on better ways to bring it to market. Of course, all this was done under the dreaded EU procurement directives of which we hear much. However, despite that, and of course there are rules, we made every effort to consider the broader benefits to home industries, a point that I'm delighted to say is now being stressed by government in many public procurements. Of course, it wasn't meant to be fluffy. We want a vig very vigorous uh, contractual structure, and we utilised the new engineering contract to achieve this, and that was very helpful. We also put in place dispute avoidance panels so that if disputes occurred, we could find non-litigious ways of resolving problems. At the turn of this year, I think some £4 billion worth of contracts had been financially settled and paid for. And I think we've had four adjudications. Lost two, won two, so surely all right. Finally, and most importantly, health and safety. Despite all the many pressures, this remained our total and absolute top priority. We recognised and believed that if we respected individuals, we looked after their safety, we helped them to create a safe environment in which they could work, and we looked after their health as well, that we would have a more engaged workforce. And I think the figures I mentioned earlier prove that that works. We had extensive on-site occupational facilities that actually underpinned all of this and meant that people could seek medical advice for any condition on site. Only 5% <coughs> of the people who took that advice were needed, needed to be passed on into the National Health Service. Nearly everyone was dealt with on site because we had doc a doctor resident with all of the facilities necessary. We formed a very collective approach to safety. We, did, we wanted to lead, but we wanted it to be collective. And we formed with uh, the senior representative of all our contractors and organisations involved, what we called SHELT, the Safety Health Leadership Team. A and they really drove the whole agenda. Despite all of this, in the early days, we found ourselves uh, suffering from recurrent minor accidents. And there was really three causes for this. The first was that method statements produced by management just weren't right. They didn't reflect the needs in the field. The second was that the supervisors were not really as competent as they could have been to do the work. And thirdly, as we all do at home when we're changing a light bulb, we look around the room, get the first thing we can, stand on a chair and wobble while we change the light bulb. We just press on regardless. We resolved it by, by, by reviewing some 1,500 method statements, by setting up training courses for supervisors so they knew their responsibilities and how to discharge them. And more importantly, we told every man on the program, if something ha is happening and you're not happy with it and it's not safe, then stop work. And that worked very effectively. There were very few stoppages, but people did stop. The result of all that is 77 million man-hours worked. My advisors tell me we would have statistically two fatalities and many, many injuries. Actually, we set targets for zero incidents, but of course we're realists. So we set a benchmark of one in a million. That is 0.1 as, as an accident frequency rate. Ultimately, we finished up with an accident frequency rate of 0.13, so just slightly above our benchmark. But we did hit 29 periods of a million man-hours with no incidents whatsoever. A number of lessons to be learned, and I'll really rattle through these. Perhaps the most important one, and my wife, Barbara, who's somewhere in the audience th th this evening, I know I'll get at least one clap that way. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, gave me a present at Christmas, and, and uh, it's a cross-stitch sampler, and on it is a, is, a, is a quotation which had taken her fancy, and I, I rather liked, and it simply said, I think I'm right in saying, those who think it cannot be done should not disturb the people who are getting on with it. <laughs> Remember the naysayers. Um, you'll see the other ones there, clarity of mission, appropriate organisation, relentless focus on delivery, respect for everybody, and everyone deserves to go home safe every night. There is no question in my mind that government, industry and stakeholders came together in an absolute common cause to make London 2012 an engineering success for UK PLC on the world stage. And that, I can assure you, it has happened. And I know that from feedback from many people from many countries. My only hope now is that our athletes can keep up the, uh, the process. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you've heard the tribute we paid to our speaker, the president of the Institute of Structural Engineers, 
and I'd like to add mine as a layman, um, but I must say I found what our speaker had to say extremely impressive. And I really don't know how this could be achieved with a force of 250 people. I mean, it's an absolutely brilliant accomplishment. Um, and you said that for you it was the experience of a lifetime, but it's going to be an experience of a lifetime for many billions of other people who will see the results of your labor. Um, and I think every person who visits the Olympic Games, every person who sees it on television, will be as impressed as we have in this audience that Britain, the UK, has achieved this enormous feat of engineering, but much bigger than that. Um, Mr. Shipley outlined the many other challenges which knit in with the engineering project. The challenges of safety, uh, the challenges of ha having regard for regeneration, um, and that, I must say, is one of the things that most impressed me, is that we've got this fantastic legacy, the ability to turn the whole of that region into a, a completely different animal. Um, and one hopes uh, to bring a lot of new housing into an area of East London which sorely needs it, and to give it another boost to the construction industry as a result of having the land which has been released uh, by the legacy program. So thank you very much, Mr. Shipley, for what I thought was an absolutely wonderful address. The Boris Lubbock trustees are very proud to be associated with this lecture, and we've heard one of the best in the whole of the 50 years that it's been going. Thank you very much. Thank you.